advice. I learned that one at summer camp. Um, my name is Melissa Barcroft. I work here at Imagination Brewing. Um, when Imagination Brewing was first started, uh, it came here with the purpose of creating a space where people can get together and have conversations about important topics um, ranging from local issues to global issues. So with new ownership in the past year with Tim and Annie Graham, is Tim even over here right now? He's hiding out in the back. Well, they're really excited to continue on with that mission. So tonight we are hosting our taproom dialogue about houselessness in Missoula. And we are talking about uh, the permanent supportive housing model. So I'm going to hand it over to Andrea and she's going to tell you more about that. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's fantastic turnout. Very, very impressed with Missoula as always. Um, I'm your moderator this evening, and we are joined with some experts in the field when it comes to folks that are experiencing houselessness. And again, we are talking specifically tonight about one solution, which is permanent supportive homes. Okay, quickly some housekeeping before we get into the panel. And I appreciate everybody being able to use your quiet inside voices. Um, first and foremost, you should know that this is being recorded on MCAT. Um, and so we will have this, it's being live streamed now as we speak, as well as available to take a look on MCAT's Facebook page, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if I am, well, we'll figure it out and let you know. Um, the other thing that I, I would like to start out um, by saying is that there are organizations here that have some material, if you wanted to pick any up. Homeward as a community housing development organization and the Missoula Housing Authority as both developers and owners of this property. We have information here. All Nations Health Center as well as Partnership Health Center and Montana Legal Services have information here for you. So in case um, you have some questions about this project or others, feel free to take a look at the booths and bring some information with you. Um, the other thing that I just want to say is that this is an issue, houselessness is an issue that um, is incredibly complicated. It's incredibly challenging. Um, Missoula is not alone in the situation that we are facing here. There are a lot of emotions and there are a lot of opinions established around this. And what I want to say tonight is that we have these experts in the room that are willing to share with us their perspective on this particular solution. And this particular solution is permanent supportive housing. And of course, we're gonna talk quite a bit about what that actually means. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that we are going to be collecting questions from the audience and we're gonna be using three by five cards. So Heather McMillan with her hand raised right there against the chalkboard. She is going to be handing out three by five cards and pens. Please go ahead and ask your questions. We will collect those and then we will go ahead and, and ask those questions when we have the time here in just a little bit. We're gonna be wrapping up this uh, tap room dialogue by seven. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we are here tonight, again, to learn about permanent supportive housing as one of the best models in the country to permanently solve for houselessness. The other thing that we are doing tonight is we are raising money because we are opening 30 new homes in the model of permanent supportive housing, just right down the street, for folks that have been chronically homeless in our community. And that means that folks need your basic needs to move into their homes. Everything from deodorant and toothpaste, toilet paper to towels. So we have a fundraiser underway. Uh, Jacqueline Flewellen and Erin Ojala that are with Homeward are standing there against the bar. That's Homeward's table. We are able to take your donations this evening. It is through an Amazon registry. You can donate directly to Homeward and we'll make sure that money goes to the Amazon registry where we help folks with their uh, items to move in. Um, or there is a QR code that you can flash your phone and make a donation directly to the Amazon registry. Importantly, if you make a donation of $10 or more tonight, you get a free beer here at Imagination Brewery. So that is worth something. So you might want to think about, you can do it at any point during the presentation tonight. I want to thank Imagination Brewery for everything that you do for our community. Thank you. Importantly, you make great beer. Thank you. Okay, all right. 
All right, so, so again, my name is Andrea Davis. I'm the executive director of Homeward, and Homeward is one of three project partners that are developing a large property in town. It's been called the Trinity Apartments. It is a 202 apartment property, two properties here in Missoula, and I wanted to give you a little background about how this came to be. So Missoula has been working on addressing solutions to houselessness for a long time, over a decade. We have a, a plan in place called Reaching Home, um, which is our plan to end houselessness, and many initiatives have been put forward. One of the things that we have strived for for years is how to develop permanent supportive housing. Where would it be located? How do we bring the resources to the table? Who provides those services? So the, um, the city and the, uh, a partner, Blue Line Development and the Missoula Housing Authority had been in negotiations with Missoula County about utilizing the land next to the detention center, which is basically excess land from when the detention center was built in the 90s. And it was determined that rather than put folks in the correction system that are homeless and that are experiencing mental and behavioral health challenges, why don't we provide homes for them to live in with services to actually address some of those root challenges? And that's what this project is. Thank you. Thank you to all the project partners. So Homer happened to buy a piece of property in Missoula's west side after um, the Skyview trailer park unfortunately closed down from that owner. And there was a, a property that didn't go forward and the neighborhood came up and said, Homeward, can you please buy this property and build something affordable? And we said yes, and we didn't actually have a project for it yet. And then came along our partners, Missoula Housing Authority and Blue Line Development, and said, we could actually make this happen if we had a larger scale project. So that's how this all came together. This 202 apartment property is actually on two separate properties here in Missoula. And 130 of those are located at the corner of Mullen and West Broadway. 30 of those apartments at, uh, located on Mullen and West Broadway are Blue Heron Place, 30 permanent supportive homes, and 100 workforce homes for folks that are earning wages like where we're working right now, quite frankly. Um, also a lot of uh, young professionals and things of, of that nature that would be eligible to be living there. In addition, there's a navigation center located on that site. That navigation center is a one-stop shop for mental, physical, behavioral health care for folks that are still living on the streets and in encampments. So that navigation center um, will, be, um, will be open a little bit later after we get the apartments all leased up and ready to go. So with that, round one of our panelists, I'm gonna go ahead and just ask folks, let's see, I'm gonna keep this microphone. So I'm gonna ask Sam to start, and I'm just gonna ask you to introduce yourself briefly, one minute. Introduce yourself, your organization, and your role in Blue Heron Place. Yes, my name is Sam Oliver. I'm the executive director of the Missoula Housing Authority. And as, as Andrea mentioned, um, our role in this project was one of a developer partner. Um, but that is not where it stops. We formed a, a firm dozen uh, Eat that, eat that microphone. Partnerships. Speak loud. Partnerships and relationships on this project have been key. And um, so we, we come in, Missoula Housing Authority, we, Missoula's largest landlord. We serve over 4,000 families. Uh, we serve those families through a variety of housing options. Uh, we have uh, your regular rental properties, but then we also have programs that specifically address um, housing solutions for veterans, disabled, senior, um, different populations portions of our population. So we're very excited to be a partner in this, um, going all the way back to the conception um, and where it was recognized as a need here in Missoula. Thank you, Sam. All right, yeah, Miranda. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Miranda Sanderson and I am a tenancy support specialist um, at Partnership Health Center. Um, Partnership Health Center is a federally qualified health center, um, and we serve um, a lot of Missoula's um, population that might not be able to access medical care elsewhere. Um, specifically, I'm on the community care team, which does also outreach with people who are unhoused. We have housing support, and um, also a nurse on our team who provides medical, su um, medical support to those um, who are living unhoused. Um, and our team will also be moving on site to Blue Heron Place. Um, so we will be the supportive service staff on site. 
um, providing um, different a range of different services to folks that will be transitioning into housing. All right, Jill, you're up. I'm Jill Bonney, and I'm the executive director of the Pavarella Center. Um, I'm sure most of you know, but the Pavarella Center is right across the street, and it's um, Missoula's only emergency shelter. Um, we do other things in addition to this main shelter over here. We also run the Johnson Street Shelter, and we have provided, I think since 2005, programming and staffing for Valor House. Um, so it's been 18 years. Um, so we do that also. Um, and our role here is really, you know, we believe that it's important to have there be 24-7 staffing at um, Blue Heron Place, especially when it is first starting. And so we will be providing the staffing when Partnership Health Center staff is not there. So mainly on nights, overnights, and weekends. And I um, feel like we're a good candidate for that since we're working with the population already. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jill. Sky. And those folks that are at the door, come on in. You can come on in. Stand by me if you want. Uh, good evening, folks. I'm Sky McGinty. I go by she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Little Shell Chippewa tribe here in Montana, um, and I'm the executive director of All Nations Health Center. Uh, we're your local urban Indian organization, and we've been here for about 53 years. Uh, we have the same philosophy that the Trinity Navigation Center is really trying to, to approach, which is the one-stop shop philosophy. So we really try and um, provide everything from primary care, behavioral health, dental, and through all of that, because we are um, an urban Indian organization, we weave culture into every single thing that we do. Um, our services are for Native people, but they're also for non-Native people as well. Um, just like our sister federally qualified health center partnership, um, we're serving the most vulnerable Missoulians who might not be able to access care in other places. So we share a patient population, we share a lot of the same goals, and it makes sense for us to be um, a part of a piece in the Navigation Center right next to these wonderful folks here. that I didn't uh, mention at the beginning was that when we were developing plans for this project, we toured other successful facilities in the Rocky Mountain West. So our design team, uh, we went to Denver, Colorado and Fort Collins, Colorado. We took a look at other permanent supportive housing properties. We looked at how some of those were standalone by themselves. Some of them were connected to other affordable apartments like this one is. We also visited navigation centers. We took all the best ideas and brought those back here. One of the questions that audience members may have is, is it a secure building? Do we have, why do we have 24 hour uh, staffing and why is that necessary? So um, Miranda, do you wanna take that? Do you wanna take that question? <laughs> Do you want me to answer it? Um, well, it is a best practice for permanent supportive housing. Um, so that is why we are trying to um, make that happen here. Um, I think for, you know, one of the main goals is also to create a, like a safe f or a feeling of community. And so um, being able to have staff 24-7 uh, if somebody is having some sort of crisis or emergency, um, uh, on the weekends or at night that there's somebody available to be able to assist. Um, same thing also with, um, yeah, if there's any um, physical health needs. Um, and then also, um, yeah, just I think having just presence of somebody there just makes people feel a little bit more comfortable as well. Thank you. Sam, would you talk about some of the ways the, the building addresses those security needs for the residents that will be uh, moving in? No, sure. We have uh, access controls um, at the entry points, and um, we really, like you said, we found in touring and talking to, to other folks, one of the, the big keys to success is offering people a nice place, stable place, safe place to reestablish their, their lives. Um, they're coming off the streets, and in a lot of cases, they have friends and others that they would like to separate from. So it's uh, something the building has been designed uh, according to, again, best practices and, and things that we saw that worked in other places. Um, and 
basically to afford uh, our, the residents uh, the most safety. One of the policies that are in place is that there is a, a guest policy. Um, and so guests will have to check in at the front desk and it is a way for us to make sure that we know who's coming in and out of the building and that way, you know, residents have the opportunity to welcome guests. However, it does need to be in a situation where um, we're making sure that the, the residents and that are in the property um, are, um, are, are both in a, it's, it's, a, it's in a controlled situation where we're, we're making sure that we, um, quite frankly, help folks say, sometimes say no to their, to their friends and relatives. I mean, it's got to be very difficult living on the street all these years. You get an apartment and then your friend says, can I come stay with you? I need a place to stay. And you have to say no. And quite frankly, we're the reason that they get to say no. Right? We're not putting the pressure on these folks to say, you can't stay with me. It's the rules by, by which the property is run and, and um, it is also a best practice. Not to say that friends won't, they won't, friends won't be able to come, it's just in a controlled manner. All right, um, let's see. So, um, I was gonna flash back to what you just had talked a bit about, Sky. Um, one of the reasons that we are completely ecstatic to partner with you is the, is the, the focus that you help bring to the project. We know that, um, uh, Native Americans are disproportionately uh, uh, represented in the homeless and houseless population. And is there a few words that you could share about the services that you currently provide at All Nations Healthcare in, in terms of the uh, behavioral health care, but how you see that unfolding at the Navigation Center on the Trinity site? Yeah, I guess I should. Uh... I guess I should have mentioned in my uh, intro that we'll be providing pay behavioral health services in that space. I was really feeling the pressure of that 60 seconds. I was like, it's coming up. Uh, but All Nations has been around again for 53 years, primarily providing behavioral health care, substance use, addiction services. That's really been the nexus of our care since our inception. Um, best practices for our Native community is really to do that healing with the community and not siloed off as an individual client. Um, our Native people and really all of our cultures, we don't heal in a silo. We don't heal alone. We don't learn alone. We do everything within our communities, within our families, whether that's blood family or a chosen family or pets even. Um, so a lot of the services that we have lined up will sort of have that cultural tinge to it, that thread that runs through it. Um, we're planning to have smudge services there. We also provide sweat lodge services, not on site, but that is something that we will gladly coordinate with clients who are interested. Um, we have another, um, a number of other ceremonies that folks would be able to access through All Nations that could potentially be inside the Navigation Center, um, and then some peer support services as well. Again, all with our Native providers who have similar lived experiences to the clients we expect at the Navigation Center, who come from similar communities, um, who might have lived experience with houselessness. So it's really important to us that our client population sees themselves reflected in our staff so that we're just able to build that trust and that rapport. And having those cultural services helps do that too because it's really a flavor of care that you can't get, I think, anywhere else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sky. I was hoping that um, it would be helpful for folks to talk about some of the roles and responsibilities that we've been working out um, in terms of the differences between property management and then the differences between the, the, the care that's given on site by um, Partnership Health Center and, and the Pavarello. And um, so there have been, we've had lots of meetings where we've talked through, all right, how does this work you know, on a 24 hour schedule? What does this look like? Um, and I'm wondering if Jill, you could start by saying, you know, sharing a little bit about your experience at the Valor House and how that uh, your staff basically helped the um, some of the clinicians and daytime staff be able to understand what might be happening with residents and ways that you can flow information that um, that helps keep folks um, stable in their homes and 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 manage to be you know lease manage to manage their lease. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Um, so we, like I said, have been working a partnership with um, Missoula Housing Authority to run um, Fowler House since 2005. 
Um, and so really we've provided the programming and the staffing. And for those of you that don't know what Valor House is, it's transitional housing for um, veterans experiencing houselessness. And so um, transitional housing is very similar to permanent supportive housing, as for permanent supportive housing is permanent. And so um, also permanent supportive housing has wraparound services like we have in transitional housing. Uh, and you know, we've just seen that work really well. We've had good success getting people you know, from transitional housing that only lasts up to two years into permanent supportive housing. And much of that is because of the support that they get when they're in the programs. Um, in the last year, Valor House has actually had four units that have been permanent supportive housing units embedded within the Valor House Transitional Housing Program. And so we've learned kind of the differences there um, and how our roles change a little bit when it's uh, permanent supportive housing. I do also just wanna say that um, it, as strange as it would be for those of us who have a house to go home to, to suddenly be living outdoors all of the time, it is that strange for individuals who have been houseless for a long period of time to come indoors. And so many times they just need to talk through that with people or they're awake in the middle of the night and they don't know what to do. Um, they're used to having other people around them that are not behind closed doors. And so to be able to come down even to the front desk and just visit with someone, it can be as simple as that that helps them maintain their success in housing. Thank you, that's an excellent example. Thank you so much. Miranda, would you mind, just going off of what Jill said, um, would you elaborate for the audience what we mean by permanent supportive housing and a harm reduction model that is what Blue, Blue Heron is and how you know, you'll be collaborating with the staff of, of the Pavarilla, but how you and your, your team there will be helping to support the residents and their success. Sure, um, yeah, so permanent supportive housing is, um, is actually um, under the housing first um, idea, which is pretty much the idea that um, people should be housed and there should be no like housing readiness or anything that would be a barrier to them getting into housing. Um, and permanent supportive housing is pretty much pro providing that permanent affordable housing um, while providing wraparound services on site. Um, and like um, Andrea said earlier, it is you know a best practice and is popping up more and more in bigger cities. And there's been a lot of data um, showing that it's working and that it's also very cost effective. Um, a lot of the people that are going to be moving into Blue Heron have history of physical illness, um, substance use disorder, mental health, um, and chronically houseless. So been on the streets for many many years. Um, and so basically um, our team and staff on site um, will be working with folks on kind of meeting them where they're at, figuring out what um, you know, their housing skills look like now and what goals they might have. So even um, as basic as just life skills. Um, and then also being able to um, meet with people regularly who do have some other goals that they've been wanting to work on but have been a bit difficult to um, address when you're in survival mode every day. Um, and then as far as harm reduction goes, basically um, that model and how we're going to implement that in the program is again not requiring that somebody is sober or not using um, to live there and really um, trying to work with people on what where they're at with that as well so um, so it's not going to be it's going to be something that we'll be working on ongoing with folks um, and won't be such a something that will be punitive or a reason why they would lose their housing um, or um, just creating a, like a non-judgmental space for people too um, and everyone will probably be in different places um, when it comes to that, but just, um, yeah, being able to create an environment that um, is not judgmental, support people where they're at, and also um, building rapport and relationships with people that so they can feel comfortable talking to us about where they're at with those things so that if they do end up wanting to um, work on their sobriety, that we can help them support that. Awesome, Miranda, thank you. Um, if you'll pass the mic to Sam, um, it would be, uh, before you start Sam, I'll just interject by saying that 
As a community, both here in Missoula and other places in Montana, as well as all over the country, it takes many different kinds of solutions to address a very complex issue like houselessness. And in some cases, you might have a program where there are prerequisites. Let's say, for example, that you have to be sober to move in. That does work for some people, and we should have that. In fact, we do in our community, through the temporary safe outdoor space that Missoula County and the Hope Rescue Mission and the United Way has put together, and there's a lot of success there. But we have a lot of people in our community that are managing challenges that will not allow them to be successful with that prerequisite. And they are the folks that we're still seeing living on the streets and in encampments, and this is an opportunity for us to meet those folks where they're at. So I really wanted to highlight that as just a way in which, as a community, we have many different solutions to be able to help folks be able to um, stabilize and eventually find a home and connection. So Sam, it's really important, I think, to under, underline the importance of the relationship of the property management company and your role as somebody that is, you know, making sure that the, the residents are safe, that maintenance is being is being conducted, and the um, the nuance here really, or the difference when working with permanent supportive housing and the relationship that your staff will have with partnership and the Pavarello in helping our residents be successful. Sure, there's a lot packed into that. Um, there's a kind of a dual nuance there, and the nuance is that um, first off, that we are housing providers at, at Missoula Housing Authority. That's what we do. We're very good at it. And for us to expand upon what An Andrea said, it, these are new relationships we have to forge. We don't provide um, uh, health and clinical services. That's not something we do. We know what we do, and we do it well. And in this partnership, um, it really reached across Missoula. We have nonprofit partner in Homeward and our developer partner in Blue Line. Together we have put together the physical property. Um, Missoula Housing Authority will be uh, in charge of maintaining the property and um, also acting as the property manager. Uh, but we do that all over town. The difference in this property, uh, and it's not so nuanced, is that it does have this wide range of services. We were very proud to be part of the original group of folks who went, looked far and wide. It, th these are things that we don't do on whimsy. These are very costly, risky projects, and they take a lot of real hard thinking uh, in the beginning. And then as they develop, you know, we live in a, a town here in Missoula with a very limited pool of service providers, unfortunately. And we live in a state with a very limited pool of service provider funding. Uh, so we are forced, each one of us here at the table, to do a lot with a little every day. And I just can't say enough about the partnerships. I mean, if you tried to take uh, five companies that do the same thing in Missoula, put them in a room, and ask them to cooperate, cooperate selflessly towards a goal, um, it, it would, I would challenge you, I think it would be fraught with peril because everybody has their way. They want to do something their way. And this project has really brought together a broad base of, of people in Missoula that care uh, about the houselessness situation and care about moving the needle here over time. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and shift us to audience questions, if that's okay. We're at 630. I know it's kind of fairly warm in here. Is that okay, Melissa, in the back? Thumbs up. Awesome. All right. So um, a few questions here. Um, well, I think this, would, with this question would go probably to you, Miranda, to start with you, which is um, what steps will be taken to welcome residents? And I know you talked about this a little bit, but I think if we could elaborate on on, um, on what you see as welcoming residents into the Blue Heron Place. Sure, um, that's actually an exciting question. Um, so we are trying to be intentional about how many people we move in at a time, just so that we can provide um, as much support to people as we can. Um, so there'll be small groups of people moving in. Um, our hope is that we can you know, uh, uh, support them with the lease signing and that process. Um, we've talked about trying to provide welcome baskets and um, things like that. Um, and then basically just um, 
trying to check in with people on a daily basis when they first move in. Um, not necessarily because we want to be annoying, but just to provide that support and see what people need. Um, and then also, hopefully, um, be able to provide as much household items as we can to folks. Um, I would say a majority of the people moving in don't have anything. Um, maybe just the backpack they have and the clothes on their back. And so, um, yeah, we're doing our best to be able to fundraise so that we can um, have a lot of those basic things already there for folks so they don't have to worry about that and just focus on the transition of moving in. Um, also, you know, trying to uh, talk about, uh, um, you know, what things maybe they do need extra support with um, when it comes to housing. So uh, we have some, um, like, kind of screeners or checklists we'll kind of do with people to say, okay, like, how comfortable are you with cleaning your apartment versus paying your rent and things like that so we can get a better idea of like what the needs are for each person and um, yeah just trying to provide a very um, comfortable supportive space um, and then we'll also be um, once folks move in have like a calendar of activities and events that will um, have happen on site so whether that's life skill classes to cooking to we're going to be doing um, at least twice a month community meals um, and also, of course, getting feedback from residents about what they would like to see on site as well. But just trying to have as much um, things going on to, yeah, give people um, that sense of community. Um, I think one thing that can also happen when people move into housing from um, being on the streets for so long is that isolation piece and not being surrounded by your friends and people all the time. And so we're trying to make that transition as smooth as possible for people by having a lot of that on site. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? Jill? I can add a little bit. Um, I think you did a great job. I just, while you were talking, I was thinking about how fun it is to stand next to someone when they walk into their first or, you know, first in a long time um, house or home. Um, their eyes light up and many times they get pretty teary-eyed and really just can't believe that it's theirs and so um, I'm just really excited selfishly um, and really excited for them also we've heard so many of the people who are going to move into Blue Heron Place um, talk about how excited they are while they're at the Pavarilla Center or we're hearing it back from the homeless outreach team and so people are really excited and they really want to do they want to be successful and they want to do a good job and they want to know how and I think having staff there 24 seven will be helpful for that. Yeah. Yeah, and from a, uh, like Jill says, this is the truly the most joyful time for all of us to do this work. This is hard work. We've been at it for a matter of years on this project now. So this is what really, really brightens our day. Um, but one of the things, since we're not on site, and many of you have not had the opportunity to actually tour the site, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions, I, I would imagine, surrounding the physical spaces. One of the things, we were able to provide tours to community members, um, some of our elected officials, uh, throughout the summer as time progressed. And one of our great senses of pride is that different people would walk into the Blue Heron Place units and they would be astounded. I'm not sure what they were expecting, but they were astounded. I mean, they say, these are nine foot ceilings. This is super spacious. You have heating, you have cooling. Um, it's all the same appliances, cabinets that are throughout the other two sites. So this is not housing that's created any different than we would for any of you. It's simply a one bedroom unit um, that affords everybody the amenities that you would find in the, in the rest of the project. And I think that's important to underline because there really is no difference in our neighbors here. Thank you, Sam. Hold on to that microphone. A couple of basic questions here that were asked, which is, uh, what is the cost to a resident? Do they pay any rent? And then second of all, can people stay for life? At Blue Heron Place, yes, they can stay for life. Yep. It is permanent. Supportive permanent supportive housing. housing. Yes. Yes, indeed. And then how about the cost in terms of, how does the rent work there? Well, the rent is, um, in a lot of our programs, is um, cap to try and capture people with income and people that have that income um, pay up to 30% of their income towards the rent. But here we're capturing it through a uh, uh, variety of vouchers uh, that provide people for, for the rent. Excellent. And I, you know, I think it's probably important to note here that we 
have many people that are living unhoused that have income, whether that be through the jobs that they're working or through social security income, for example. So um, also, this often allows the opportunity for people who, if you can imagine if you've been living houseless for a long time and your personal things have been swept away or you've lost them or they've gotten stolen, you don't have an ID, you don't have a social security card, you don't have the ways to go out and actually apply for things, right? Even a job. And so the opportunity, both through the Navigation Center as well as the services at, at Blue Hair in Place, will allow people to connect with some of those very basic things. There's a lot of people out there that might be eligible for veterans benefits, for example, but haven't actually had the opportunity to sign up and get those benefits. This would be an opportunity for that as well. Okay. All right, we have some really good questions here. So one of the questions is, um, is there more funding sources to expand this project? And I'll, and I'll ask the same thing, which is, is there more permanent supportive housing planned in Missoula? Sam? <laughs> well, um, I'm not one, currently we don't have anything on the blocks, but one of the things that this will show, hopefully, is that this model is successful. And we hope to demonstrate. In Missoula, um, we're unique. Uh, we have more services than other parts of the state. And uh, we lead by example. And our city leadership is trying to do that right now with uh, a, a, an issue with increasing need in houselessness. And it's increasing at a rate that's hard to keep up with. So in being forward-looking uh, uh, community members and and organizations that provide housing and services, I would say that this really opens the door to show a successful model and hopefully increase stock in coming years. Excellent, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, amen to that. This is a really nice comment. I need to read this comment as well as the question. The comment says, thanks for everything you're doing. For those of us in the community who struggle to empathize with our neighbors experiencing homelessness, how do you all think we can incorporate the spirit of this project into public education to produce a cultural shift towards community care? Sky, can I start with you? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wrong answers. This is on Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, to what everyone up here has said, these people are our neighbors. These are the people who shop at the same grocery stores that we do. Their kids go to the same schools. We are accessing similar resources. You'll see them walking down the street. And it might be hard to tell the difference between someone who is houseless and who's not. And that's the point, is that these are still people and they are our friends and our neighbors and our relatives at the end of the day. And so I think making that mind shift from this is an othering kind of thing, this is someone that we have to swoop in and save, or this is someone that we have to just bolster all of these things for because they're different from us. No, this very easily could be any one of us in this room, and it might have been at some point. So I think sort of expanding what we consider to be our community and our family and our Missoula is really critical in sort of expanding and making that cultural shift. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, I appreciate that, excellent. I think we can all probably talk about this for a while, but there's a lot of good questions, so okay, I'll, I'll maybe ask another one. Um, so, uh, somebody asked, as a mental health care provider, can I refer folks directly to Blue Hair in Place? How? So this is gonna be talking about a little bit about the coordinated entry system and how this works in Missoula. Who wants to take that? Miranda, you're up. Um, yeah, so um, how we work in Missoula with the unhoused population um, what is that we have a coordinated entry system, is what it's called. Basically, it is a huge list of everybody who is unhoused. And they have to consent, obviously, to be a part of that system. But we ask them questions related to health, and other um, conditions that they have going on. Um, and basically, um, they get prioritized based on kind of those circumstances and um, like kind of their vulnerability, I guess. Um, and then we use that list to um, prioritize housing resources for folks that are appropriate for them. So for Blue Heron, we actually um, are using that same prioritization process. Um, 
but another initiative that we have in Missoula is called Fuse. It's frequent, utilize, or frequent users of systems engagement. Basically, we are identifying people from um, getting data from the hospitals and jail um, of who are those uh, highest utilizers of those services. And then from there, we're able to try and connect with those folks and um, really try and provide wraparound services. And those uh, folks that qualify for that um, program are prioritized for Blue Heron. So those are folks that um, use the ER on average two to three times a week. Um, and just to give some numbers, um, a hospitalization day is around $1,600 here in Missoula. And if somebody didn't have any income and we were subsidizing their full rent, it would only be 1100 a month. So just really cutting costs also. Um, but yeah, basically, if you do have somebody who's interested, um, that's the process is going through that coordinated entry system and then um, from there, they're able to get kind of uh, prioritized based on their needs and what housing options are available. I just want to add to that when you talk about um, high utilizers of the hospital and the jail, when there are not enough shelter beds in a community, then the only place for someone to go is jail or the hospital. Thank you. So, Jill, this is a question that was just asked, and it was yeah. asked in combination of some, of some other things. Um, but I think what people are curious about is what is the cost to taxpayers when, you know, and, and, and the question wasn't necessarily asked of, like, what's the cost of this development project? But I think what we really want to get at is what is the cost of taxpayers um, for providing these services or not providing these services? And, Miranda, you hit on that a little bit. Um, but one of the things that I thought might be helpful to elaborate on is that, um, you know, what, at, the, at the very belly of all this is that folks that are experiencing homelessness one way or the other are lacking social connection. And it might be because they have a behavioral mental health challenge or homelessness might have caused that. Honestly, it could be because they have a drug or alcohol issue or quite frankly, homelessness could have caused that drug or alcohol issue. But at the end of the day, a lot of folks are lacking social connection in order to be able to help get through some of these challenges. Or maybe their rent went up $400 overnight and they didn't have anywhere to couch surf. That's a real reality too. So when we think about the cost to taxpayers, um, is there some information that you could continue to elaborate on in terms of uh, the FUSE model? And really, again, what we're trying to do to decrease the cost to um, Police, fire, the emergency room. You're talking to me? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to anyone that wants to help me answer that uh, question. Anybody who wants to take that? I'll start. So, I, I don't have dollar numbers, obviously, but we know that the solution to homelessness is homes, and houselessness is houses. And um, th this is a beginning, right? And so, is it going to solve you know, the problem of houselessness? Is it going to solve um, the fact that we see people sleeping in tents outside in Missoula? No, but it's gonna help. Um, and so we need to keep doing projects like this. Um, and like Sam said, and, and hopefully this will be a successful program so we can continue. But we know that when people do not have homes and shelters over their heads, then services in the community, like the fire department, the police, the hospitals are all highly utilized and that costs taxpayers a lot of money. It costs less to house people than it does to continue services like that. And it's not good for the people that are our neighbors living um, without homes. Thank you. Um, before I get into sort of my long spiel on this, um, I do want to just like come back to that cultural shift piece too. I know that the dollars are what are palatable to us at the end of the day. It's a digestible piece of information. It's what gets votes. It what's changed minds. I understand that. But at the end of the day, again, these people are people first. They are not a data point. They are not money to the system. They are not a burden to us or our system. They are people and they are neighbors. Um, so again, with that, 
recognizing that taking care of someone, providing medical care, providing housing for them is ultimately the largest disruptor in negative health outcomes that we see in across our populations. To me, housing is really the nucleus of health. If you're housing people, these negative health outcomes that arise from sleeping in the street, being exposed to elements, being exposed to safety concerns outside, those go away. The social connectedness, that increases so much. And we are mammals, we are humans who crave that social connectedness. We need that for our health as much as we need an ingrown toenail removed. Maybe a bad example, that was the only thing I could think of. <laughs> Um, and so I, I just want to reiterate that ultimately housing people and taking care of them is a cost saving to Missoula, to the state of Montana, to this nation, to the globe, than for not caring for these people. And then, you know, they turn around and they are using the ER two to three times out of the week. They are receiving care that is intervention rather than prevention when we could just pay for prevention, which would be housing. Um, so I just want to reiterate again that, you know, these are our neighbors, they are people at the end of the day. I know that the money is important too, but ultimately taking care of these folks is really what's going to save us that bottom line. Excellent response. Thank you. All right, switching back to the building. Uh, Sam, what are some of the most notable or unique features of this building? Well, again, you'll see the same features you see in a lot of our, our newer properties. Um, we designed to an Energy Star standard for you know, energy consumption, energy savings. Um, that's appliances, light fixtures, uh, everything that falls under that. We, if you look up on our projects, you'll see solar arrays on each of those as well. So um, we we build these buildings internally for great durability and great strength over time. As a housing authority, we house families, um, and some of those families may live in our properties for years and years and years. Uh, when that family moves out, that unit is brought back up to a standard that's as new as possible. Everybody deserves to move into a new unit. We don't just vacuum floors. So um, it, it, this is just an extension of that belief and policy that we have. We build very good, durable uh, places with not a lot of, we're making some great strides in the, in the building industry. For instance, we're not using carpet anymore. You can imagine the miles and miles of carpet and rental properties that just get ripped out you know, after our family has lived there for, for a certain amount of time. So over time, we've really learned what works um, in, in our properties uh, to, to ensure uh, that we can maintain them at, at the lowest cost and the, the easiest turnaround when we need to. So we're very proud of that on these properties as well. Awesome. Thank you. You know, I'm going to add that one of the unique features as well, because we have a navigation center on site that'll be welcoming people that are still unhoused. Um, we have a courtyard on site that folks, if they come with pets, right? Like th we've seen people, right? When Hurricane Katrina came along, people didn't leave their house because of their pets, right? So we know that folks do have animals and pets, but we necessarily can't bring them inside all the time. So we have a courtyard where people that um, are coming to the Navigation Center to um, receive services and get connected, there's an outdoor space where people can be with their pets while they are connected with different services on site there. So that's kind of a, one of our unique features. The other is that you know, we, we build common areas in our properties, both at Missoula Housing Authority and Homeward does, because we want to create spaces for residents to be able to connect. Living in an apartment is small, and sometimes it's nice to be able to have a community room where you can throw a birthday party or be able to get together with your neighbors. In this case, one of the things that we took away from our research was that folks that have um, been experiencing homelessness for this amount of time are not interested in common areas up on the third floor in the corner of the building. They want to be where the action is, which is down where the staff are. So there on the first floor right next to the front desk is actually a large common area. And there will be TV and places for people to do board games and gather, but to be part of a community. Because people will still be living in their own apartment and this is a way for folks to continue to stay connected with each other. Okay, we have just eight minutes left. We're just winding down. We have a few more questions here. Um, so, one of the questions that is asked is, what steps are taken to integrate the Blue Heron residents 
with the other residents uh, of the property at Maple Street uh, Flats and our neighbors. How are we going to be building a larger community? <laughs> well, the the two different, I mean, the, the buildings are pretty separate, I would say. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that all plays out a little bit with all of the, you know, the two different buildings on site. Um, but as far as some of the neighbors and businesses and things like that, I know there already has been some outreach um, to some of them just to, to talk about what the program is and um, just to give that education. But I think ongoing, um, the goal is for us to continue doing that with trying to um, build relationships with those folks and hopefully have, like, provide that clear stream of communication if issues do come up. Um, and hopefully more education events. I think we're also going to be doing a big, you know, opening, and so inviting all of those folks to be there and just to be familiar with us. You know, give out phone numbers so if they do have issues, they can contact contact us directly. Um, and hopefully, yeah, doing that rather than maybe calling the authorities or something. So yeah, that's some of it. I think. Thank you. Yeah, Jill. We can add just a little bit more, just from. Um the Valor House standpoint, a few years ago, Missoula Housing Authority built cornerstone apartments behind uh, Valor House, and they came in and, you know, really had meetings with the residents of Valor House and talked to them, you know, really about what the project was going to be like, and even said, what would you like this space between the two buildings to be like? Do you want us to build a wall between you, or do you want, like, a community area, or what would you like? And really overwhelmingly, the veterans that were living at the Valor House said, those are our neighbors. We really want to be there with them and we'd like to invite them into our space also as much as we can. And so I think a lot of it will happen naturally too. Awesome. Thank you. One of the questions that was asked is that this um, Blue Heron Place sounds like it is for singles and that is mostly true, although couples would be evaluated. Right. So but let's talk about that and then also um, address if there is any permanent supportive housing models in Missoula that are specifically for families or what might be available for families in Missoula. What was the first question? The first question is, <laughs> is this for singles or are couples allowed? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yes, couples are allowed. Um, it just that they have to would have to meet the income or you know, it's cap, uh, there's an income cap. So if there if there's somebody who maybe has income and somebody that doesn't, you know, it just depends on that. Um, we've also been in contact with um, the housing authority just about if somebody um, had children too and they wanted them to be living in the unit with them. Um, and that is, I think, you know, there's just you know lease pieces to it, right? Having people on the lease, but that um, that that is a possibility for folks. Um, so yeah. I think just on a case-by-case -case basis, really. But right now, I would say um, most, if all, are individuals moving in. There might be a couple that aren't, but. Just in regards to what's available for families as well, I mean, this model, permanent supportive housing, is a, is a pretty specific model. And I would say that that's probably something for sure, as a community, we want to have in our future planning is something specific for families. But as you may be aware, the YWCA in partnership with the Missoula Interfaith Collaborative has opened up the Meadowlark project on 3rd Street. And not only is that um, our community's um, a domestic violence shelter, but there is family housing there in partnership with Missoula Interfaith Collaborative. And um, there, as you can imagine, it's full <laughs> um, because folks need a place to be. Um, and so, uh, that that ex that partnership with Missoula Interfaith Collaborative has expanded to folks, you know, still trying to be able to maybe potentially house families in church basements and things like that. But really, the answer at Meadowlark was to have an actual facility where families could be. And um, I would imagine that this is going to be an area that we will continue to focus on as a community, because um, both, you know. Almost every area in terms of demographic is rising, but one of the things that I thought would be of interest to all of us is that folks 62 and over is one of the highest demographic rates that are increasing in houselessness in Missoula, but also across Montana. 
And I think we can understand that why. People are living on fixed incomes and they've been maybe able to afford their rental home for a long period of time, but then when their rental home goes, it increases by $400 overnight, folks cannot afford to both pay their rent and their medication and their other costs of living. And so sadly, that is the, the demographic where we're seeing the highest increase um, in homelessness rates at this time. Okay, so we're getting near to the end. Um, one more question here, which is, how can community members help? Now, of course, I'm gonna round us out with another reminder on donations, but from your perspective, how can community members help? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question because it's a very basic one. Um, tonight, you can very clearly help by donating to this project. Um, but as the, the problem of houselessness expands in our community, I think dialogue is the most important thing. I think people need to talk around their tables. They need to talk to their children. They need to talk to their parents. Um, it's, it's front of mind. It's, it's in front of us every day. It's on your way to school. Um, and so have those important discussions because we do have a cultural shift that needs to, to happen here to, to, to taking care of our neighbors. And again, I'll, I'll just say, Missoula does a great job of leading by example. And I think if each one of us can again talk about this, this issue, it's not going away, it's actually getting worse. And um, you know, if, if we talk in an educated dialogue and again, uh, Get, up, get to all the public meetings that talk about this. Go to your city council meetings. Um, there, there's a lot of, there's a wide breadth of impact that people can make. It's the old uh, thing that everybody gets uh, sucked into and says, oh, it's just my voice. But heck, you have a spirited conversation down at DraftWorks or something or Imagination Brewing, take all the people at that table and go to city council. Tell them what your ideas are, so. Great, all right. Thanks, Sam. Miranda. Um, yeah, so for Blue Hair in Place, I would say again, putting a plug in for the donations, um, uh, and also some other um, ways you could potentially help out at Blue Heron is um, if you ever wanted to donate like a, a big meal, so we're going to have community meals, um, or if you, um, also some ideas we had were if anybody has any skills or trades and they wanted to come and teach a class or do a workshop or a group, um, that would be really awesome if you wanted to, you know, um, volunteer your time to come do that. Um, yeah, so those are some ways, I think, as far as supporting Blue Heron right now. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Jill? Yeah, I would really echo what Sam was saying. Like, a lot of times if you're having a discussion with someone, you can say, actually, you know, I was at this thing in imagination, and this is what they were talking about, and maybe you'd like to come to another you know, um, conversation like this with me. Um, I think that's really great. I also, I, I believe I can speak for the other three up here with me, that please reach out to organizations if you have a question. We would love to just answer your questions so that you don't have to wonder um, if things that you're hearing are true or if they are or what. I'm always happy to have a conversation. Um, and then I would say not just to pitch with the pod for volunteers, but just coming over and volunteering can really help you do something alongside the people that we serve. So serving a meal, helping prepare meals in the kitchen. We have several people that um, are staying with us that work in our kitchen and are preparing meals, um, 600 to 700 meals per day. And that's a fun place to volunteer. And then also with our homeless outreach team. Um, they are working with people who are living unsheltered in the community, many of which are going to um, be housed at Blue Heron. And so just getting out there and seeing the other side of things I think is really beneficial. So happy to have any and all of you as volunteers. Thank you, Jill. All right, Sky. Um, ditto. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say anything that you haven't already heard uh, these lovely folks say. I guess I would just, again, under, underscore the fundraising that's happening tonight and ongoing. I think what we saw come out of COVID or whatever phase of the pandemic we're in right now, um, mutual aid goes so incredibly far. When you donate to your community, when you buy material goods, 
to uh, just make conditions better for our neighbors, that goes such a long way for our neighbors to make them feel that they are welcome here and they are dignified and they have value in our community. Um, that goes a huge long way. Um, you've also heard a number of volunteer opportunities. I think each of our organizations would gladly welcome that. Um, and I, I always say that, you know, there's a lane for everybody in advocacy. If you can't donate $1,000, $100, $20 tonight, come out and volunteer. Come and make a meal. Um, come to the taproom dialogues. Go and have conversations with your family and your neighbors. You know, education is free. Showing up, literally just showing up for our neighbors is free. And so there's a litany of different things that um, our neighbors can plug into and the ways that you can plug into for our neighbors. Right on. All right. So with that, I want to say two things. I know. I know. Let's give a round of applause right for all that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, want to, I just want to emphasize one thing. If you are experiencing homelessness yourself or you know somebody that is houseless, if you are uh, working in the behavioral health system and want to refer to somebody, the easiest way right now is to contact the Missoula Housing Authority. They have a waiting list, there's an application process, and they will connect the, um, the person looking for a home at Blue Heron Place to that coordinated entry system that, um, that Miranda talked about. Lastly, uh, as mentioned, Tonight we're also gathering funds, and so we have a table over here. Jack, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, and Aaron, thank you. And if you um, are so inclined, feeling generous tonight, every dollar counts. So even 10 bucks, right, gets you a free beer tonight. Um, but also we're going to go out there and use that money, like, like we said, to help people with basic household necessities to welcome them into their new home. So I want to thank you and congratulate everybody here for being part of the conversation. You took time away from your families, from your evenings, to come and be part of the solution. I want to recognize you for doing that. Thank you. First round of applause to you. And then I would just like to thank our esteemed panel and all the work that they do for our community. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Cheers. Oh, and one more time here, I want to thank Imagination Brewing Company for everything that they do. Be an awesome place. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you to your team. Really appreciate it. And for real, last round of applause for our wonderful moderator, Andrea Davis. Uh, the wish list? Oh, is it actually listed here? Thank you, that was, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, right, there is a QR code and there's actually a wish list. So if you know like a wedding registry, we actually have a registry for folks for what's needed. So go ahead and just click on that QR code and then we can go ahead and make sure that your donations are going to the um, most critical items needed for our new residents. Thanks again, everybody, appreciate it.